Okay, we're back. Previously on the Crusades, we had uh, the very surprising capture of Jerusalem and the Holy Land by a crusading army. This crusading army had fairly unclear motives to start. They picked up the animosity of the Byzantine Empire and the Byzantine Emperor along the way, um, animosity that was rather mutual. And the resulting crusader states quickly became factional um, and part of the, shall we call it, political ecology of the Middle East or of the Holy Land or the Levant or any of the names we want to use for it. And so we ended up with a bunch of what we might call petty kingdoms. The county of Edessa up in the north, the county of Tripoli, uh, run by Raymond, the Principality of Antioch um, between Edessa and Tripoli, and then the Kingdom of Jerusalem centered around Jerusalem. And following the First Crusade, we have a period of relative peace from uh, 1100 to 1140, approximately. And in this period of peace, the Crusaders and, the, and the, the areas that they ruled, they were neither benevolent rulers nor really aloof elites, but kind of just as they were in Europe, uh, ru ruling their little states as they would rule any of their counties or dukedoms or whatever within Europe. And in this kind of rulership, the rulership has recently been described as something called rough tolerance. That is to say, these elites, the, the, the counts and um, princes and kings and their soldiers, protected Muslim and Jewish communities when it was in their interest to do so. But they also instituted violence, and they used violence as a tool. All right? General coexistence... The general coexistence here is generally peaceful for this 40-year period, um, and there is some cultural exchange, uh, but violence is also a means of creating and enforcing authority, and it was one which the rulers of these principalities were not afraid to use, just as they would not have been afraid to use it uh, back in Europe. The Crusaders are, however, not interested in converting people. They don't preach, they don't uh, go out of their way to make uh, Christians and Jews, uh, sorry, Muslims and Jews convert to Christianity. Um, and this continues to be true actually all the way into the late 13th century. There's a little period at the end of the 13th century into the 14th century where conversion all of a sudden kind of ticks up a bit, but uh, not really a theme of the Crusades. Uh, the presence of the Crusader states perhaps re, uh, revitalized Mediterranean trade somewhat. Um, there's some reason to think so. The Italian city-states in particular, for some reasons that we'll get into, did quite well from the Crusades. But that's more of a later phenomenon. This period, this 40-year period, also saw the development of the military orders, the Knights Templar and Hospitaller particularly because there was a general difficulty in maintaining manpower in the Holy Land. If you have an armed pilgrimage, which is what in theory the First Crusade was, those pilgrims eventually go home, and then you have no one left guarding your castle. And that's a problem. The Templars, the Knights Templar, were created mm, sort of circa 1125, um, and approved by the Council of Troyes uh, in 1128, with a rule created for them by this guy, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, who also wrote a treatise in praise of the new knighthood, which uh, kind of formalized their, uh, or made an argument for the existence of Christian warrior knights. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about this particular image uh, with, with Mary shooting milk into Bernie's mouth uh, next when we talk about uh, the weird bits of medieval religion that we will get to. 
Um, the Templars are also exempted from taxes and tithes, um, just like Bernard's, Bernie's here, uh, owned or monastic order of Clairvaux, uh, by the Pope in 1139. And so the Templars become this pseudo-monastic, pseudo-military organization. They're supposed to dedicate their lives to prayer. They live a monastic lifestyle. They're supposed to be chaste, but they're not cloistered. Um, mostly what they did was build and garrison castles. And so the kind of inhabitants of the Holy Land are hardly fanatical, or the Christian inhabitants, inhabitants of the Holy Land are hardly fanatical. They're part of the ecosystem. Um, and most of the problems in this 40-year period come from disruptions from outsiders coming in, Christian outsiders coming in and wanting to actually wage holy war. So, for example, oh, sorry, that's the seal of the Knights Templar there. Okay. Um, so, for example, Edessa, the first crusader state, the one that's all the way up at the top there, which tellingly has the end dates of 1144. Um, although it's the first crusader shape, it's in a sparsely populated area, it's relatively weak, and the rulership is questionable, shall we say. And in 1143, the year before Edessa ceases to exist, John II Comenus, the Byzantine emperor, and King Folk of Jerusalem both die, leaving those two states in temporary disarray. Uh, Imid al-Din Zengi, uh, who is the governor of Mosul, uh, often what is now Iraq, it's a city that's been in the news recently, right, easily besieges and, uh, sorry, is in a currently in a power struggle with Damascus, the Emirate of Damascus, which you kind of see in there. There's the difference between the dominion of the Atabeg, the Atabeg is a term for governor, um, and Damascus, which is a, a coherent polity. Um, he is in a power struggle with Damascus, and he, in the course of this power struggle, besieges and takes Edessa in December of 1144. And even though he's fighting with Damascus, uh, with this Zengi is fighting with Damascus, Damascus doesn't decide to come and help Edessa. And it's not because Edessa is Christian and Damascus is Muslim, but because 10 years earlier in 1129, um, Baldwin II of Jerusalem, the previous king of Jerusalem, under kind of pressure from outside crusaders, to do something with his kingdom of Jerusalem, uh, had assaulted, had broken the alliance that he had made with Damascus and assaulted the city of Damascus. So the city of Damascus was not going to help out these crusader states, even though they were fighting Zangi, who is their enemy. Uh, Zangi himself is assassinated in 1146 and by, succeeded by Nur al-Din, who is his son. The fall of Edessa in 1143, due to these political machinations and moderate incompetence, shall we say, was received much more forcefully than Al-Hakim's destruction of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in 1009, which I talked about last lecture. By this time, Western Europe is really fully focused on the Levant. Eugene III, who is the Pope at the time, sends out a papal bull. A papal bull is neither uh, an animal nor a pile of poo, but refers to the bulla, which is Latin for a knob or a seal. It's a, a papal letters, official papal letters were marked by a huge hunk of lead with a seal stamp, st stamped in them, and that is the bulla. Um, so this is an official papal letter entitled Quantum Predicasores. Uh, papal bulls, as they are called, are referred to or are entitled by the first two or three words of those bulls. 
So quantum predecessores, Latin for those who have gone before us. Um, calling, and this bull by Eugene III calls a third, uh, calls a second crusade, calls a second crusade to retake the county of Edessa. This crusade is preached by none other than our favorite breast milk lover, uh, Bernard of Clairvaux. Bernard comes in and out actually a lot of uh, 12th century history. He's pretty much, he's the most powerful person who isn't a pope in the 12th century. In fact, he's more powerful than most of the popes while he's alive. Um, he is all over the place writing all sorts of things. Probably the most powerful medieval figure no one's really ever heard of except for experts. In any case, the Second Crusade, which is again preached by Bernard of Clairvaux, is much more organized than the first. Um, although this Second Crusade also again sees pogroms against Jewish populations within Europe. Uh, Bernard objects to these, um, but even if he's objecting to these, he's not. It's one of those things like, ooh, great, but the reasons are problematic because Bernard thinks that the Jews need to survive and suffer. Um, so you can't kill them. They, they need to stay over there and be miserable instead. So, you know, not maybe the best motivations, but better than murder, I suppose. In any case, as I said, the Second Crusade is much more organized than the first. Uh, it sees the first one, remember, was led by uh, Count Raymond IV of Toulouse. Uh, this one is led by King Louis the, the Seventh of France and his wife, Eleanor of Aquitaine. Um, it sees larger participation. German and English uh, forces decide to join Conrad the Third of uh, Holy Roman Emperor Conrad the Third of Germany decides to join. Some English troops decide to join because the investor con controversy um, has been over for a couple of years. It ended again with that conquered out of Worms in eleven twenty two. It's also more widespread. That is, it's not just about the Holy Land anymore. Um, I think I'm actually blocking some of this, aren't I? Yes, I am. Yeah, there we go. That should be better. Um, actually, I'm going to need that later. How are we going to do this? I'm going to get smaller. That's what we're going to do. Okay. Um, and as you can see, a force from, so not only do forces head towards the Holy Land, um, but also a navy from the Netherlands and England, from the Low Countries in England, uh, stops by Lisbon and captures Lisbon um, on their way to the Holy Land. And also a German crusade is launched uh, it's called the Wendish Crusade against the Wends, who you might have remembered actually do feature in the Lord of the Rings. The Wends are kind of a, a quote unquote pagan tribe on the Baltic Sea or whatever tribe ish, whatever tribe means here on the Baltic Sea. And a crusade is launched against them again with Bernard's encouragement. Um, so we have an expanding of the targets of crusades as against enemies of Christendom rather than something to do with the Holy Land in Jerusalem slash helping the Byzantine emperor out. It does not go well. Um, the Second Crusade is an incompetent failure. Um, the French and Germans Take the take an overland uh, take a overland route again, uh, the same as the first crusade had taken because you know if it worked that time it'll work again. Uh, Manuel the first Comenos, who is the emperor Byzantine emperor at the time, is deeply suspicious of the crusaders as they come to his city. He doesn't know why they're there. He doesn't understand what's going on. He actually makes a truce with the Sultanate of Rome, who he's currently fighting, so he can have his military forces ready to fight the Crusaders, because he doesn't know what's up. The Crusading armies, particularly uh, the French army, is harassed by Turkish forces as it tries to cross Anatolia. And Louis VII eventually gives up on this, gets on a ship, and sails to Jerusalem. His army is mostly destroyed. 
And here in the background we have, you know, well, Eleanor of Aquitaine, as played by Catherine Hepburn, uh, talking about how she uh, negotiated everything there. Um, the Lisbon fleet, however, arrives successfully and really without incident, and this kind of sets things up again. Because uh, it sets things up for the future because people start to realize that maybe maybe walking across Anatolia is a bad idea and we could just with boats that would be good um one of the problems however is that when the crusader those crusaders who do arrive after all this that you know maybe 5,000 members of, of Louis the army and a couple others and then the English and uh, Dutch crusaders who had made it over on the boats well, they showed up and they should be doing something, so they decide to attack Damascus again. Which, in turn, allies with Nur al-Din, that is Zanghi's son, in the north, against the Crusaders. And now you have twice, um, you have managed to unite your two, two of your two people who are enemy, who are fighting each other against you. Right? So, oops. Um, and in the end, uh, Eleanor divorce, divorces Louis um, and actually marries Henry II of England, which is a whole fun thing. Uh, watch this movie, The Lion in Winter, where I'm pulling these scenes from. It's a great, it's an amazing movie. Anyway, the crusade doesn't capture everything, anything and pisses everyone off in the region. Uh, Bernard of Clairvaux um, dies pretty much in shame. Uh, from the result of the Third Crusade. It, does, it kind of breaks him in a lot of ways. Okay, so they, the, the, the county of Edessa is no more, but everything else kind of in the Crusader States is maybe okay, except for you got a lot of people who don't are looking at you sideways because you keep breaking treaties with them now. And then, in 1171... Al-Nasir Salah al-Din Yusuf ibn Ayyub, uh, nephew of one of Nur al-Din's generals, is made Sultan of Egypt. And not many people may have heard of Al-Nasir Salah al-Din Yusuf ibn Ayyub, but many people have heard of Saladin, which is the anglicization or Latinization of his name, Salah al-Din al-Din. So Saladin, here depicted in what looks to me to be a Persian manuscript, um, unites Syria, Egypt and Syria be, um, because of the uh, agreements made through previous uh, negotiations and also his family ties. Uh, the Byzantine Emperor Emmanuel I dies in 1180, and so that ends any sort of even a weak Byzantine alliance with the Crusader states. And then we have a series of events within the Crusader Kingdom of Jerusalem, which are not at all good. And here I have helpfully labeled the characters you will be encountering uh, in Kingdom of Heaven next week, which are all historical persons. So Manuel I dies in 1180, as I said. Baldwin IV, King of Jerusalem, dies of leprosy in 1185. His nephew, Baldwin V, is immediately crowned at eight years old. Uh, his mother is Sibylla, who is Baldwin IV, the previous king's sister. His father is not Guy de Lucien, but Sibylla is then married to Guy de Lucien. Baldwin V dies before his ninth birthday. Uh, Guy de Lusignan is himself crowned king as Sibylla's husband, as the next in line to the throne. Um, an interesting thing I found while kind of doing this, Guy de Lusignan's grandmother, uh, who died in 1144, and was, as far as I can tell from northern France, is named Saracina, or Saracen, which... I don't know what to do with that, but it's kind of an interesting fact. Guy is a little bit 
big for his boots, as will be accurately depicted in the movie we watch next week, um, and uses his friend Renaud de Chatillon, who is Prince of Antioch. He's king of, he's head of one of the major principalities in the, um, ooh, that got cut off, who's major, head of one of the major principalities, Crusader Kingdoms. Come back here. There we go. Um, he uses Reynaud to provoke Saladin. And provoke him, he does. Um, in July of 1187, the Crusaders, the, the uh, Muslim army marches forth from Damascus and meets the Crusader force at the Battle of Hattin. Uh, Hattin is an extinct volcano. Uh, the horns of Hattin are an extinct volcano in the middle of the desert, and the Crusaders are destroyed almost to a man. They are almost all captured or killed uh, because fighting while dehydrated is hard, particularly in armor. Guy, that is King Guy of Jerusalem, is ransomed eventually, uh, well, in 1189, I believe. Reynaud is executed. And there's a little story behind that, and the, actually the depiction in uh, the movie is fairly accurate on this front. The relic of the true cross, that is the cross on which Jesus was said to have been crucified and which was carried before the crusader army whenever it left the city of Jerusalem, was captured and returned upside down on a spear point. Uh, the 200 Templars and Hospitallers, Knights Templar and Knights Hospitaller, who were captured at Hatton were executed. Um, while uh, the rest of the army was let go, except for those Muslims who had been con who had converted to Christianity, who were also executed as heretics, as lapsed believers. And Jerusalem and almost all of the Crusader territory is quickly captured by Saladin. This series of events is so shocking that Pope Urban III, who was the Pope at the time, is said to have died of shock upon hearing it. Gregory VIII, who is Urban III's successor, immediately releases um, a papal bull entitled Audita Tremendi, having heard the horrible things, calls, which calls for a third crusade. This crusade is mostly, um, or is in large part and larger than the other, the previous crusades, German in its participation, or Holy Roman Imperial in its participation. Alas, the leader of the crusade, uh, Frederick Barbarossa, or Redbeard, here depicted without a beard, on his way to the Holy Land using the overland route, like an idiot, tries to cross a river in armor, or naked, as the depiction below suggests, at the age of 67, and drowns. And the German army, or the Holy Roman Imperial Army, more or less falls apart. Maybe 5,000 men make it to Acre under the command of his son, also named Frederick. Um, this, as an aside, is a really frustrating bit of uh, medieval things that they keep on naming their sons the same name as them. So I was trying to figure out which Henry of, uh, was it Henry of Champagne this document was referring to, and it turns out the Dukes of Champagne for 150 years are all called Henry, which, why? Um, even worse, in Toulouse there is a 90-year period where all the counts are Raymond, and all the bishops are also Raymond. Just, just come up with other names. Help. Anyway, at the same kind of, as the same time, Henry II of England had just died in 1198. That is um, uh, uh, Eleanor of Aquitaine's second husband, and Richard I, Eleanor's son, becomes king. 
and he immediately sets about preparations for crusade, along with his fellow king, Philip Augustus. And again, these images are taken from Lion in Winter. Excellent movie. Um, there has been um, insinuations of a uh, non-platonic relationship between Philip and Richard. It is unclear as to the validity of those, although the movie, again, go see it, uh, plays into that quite a lot. Um, also, that is Anthony Hopkins. I think that's kind of, I don't I didn't recognize, I was like, why do I know what the face is? It's Anthony Hopkins. Still, um, oh, and in this case, both Richard and Philip take a sea route, right? Um, Philip from Genoa, uh, Richard from Marseille, because Marseille is actually at this point Angevin or English and not, and not French, um, both going through Messina in uh, Sicily and then arriving in Acre. E this crusade is useful, but not conclusive. Um, the kind of major points from this crusade is that Richard, the armies in the Levant, in the Holy Land, under Richard's direction, do manage to recapture most of the lost territory that Saladin had conquered, particularly after Saladin dies in 1193 and his sons start squabbling over things, um, but does not manage to recapture Jerusalem. The Saladin and Richard themselves are often seen as these knightly uh, opponents. They're, it's very big. It's a very, very, a very chivalric idea of two great, uh, kind chivalric generals um, going at each other. Uh, so it's kind of a, almost a, I don't know. It's it's a romantic, a romantic big R romantic moment. Um, and in the end. Before he kind of leaves, Richard turns his focus to Saladin's base of power in Egypt, a decision that will have consequences for the courses of later crusades. Richard is, of course, imprisoned on his way home and released in 1194, after which we do not have the events of Ivanhoe. Um, if they were, that's when they're supposed to have happened, of course. And Richard is eventually killed by a crossbow bolt in a siege in 1199. Saladin, as I said, dies in 1193, and his heirs squabble, and again we have this kind of factionalism in the Holy Land. And so, afterwards, the Crusader states are more or less the strip of coastland along the uh, Mediterranean Sea from, what is it, Tortosa to Jaffa, um, as well as the island of Cyprus, which is actually quite important. And so, at this point, we come to the Fourth Crusade. Um, the, the Stupid Crusade. Um, Crusading was, at this point, already an immense drain on resources and manpower from Europe. There are some estimates that it actually the Crusades actually set Europe back um, in kind of technological um, development just because they took so much resource. But even considering that, this Crusade is quite dumb. So how does it get going, and why is it stupid? Well, in 1198, Lotario de Segni, Segni, Ugh, Italian, makes Pope Innocent III, or is made Pope Innocent III, and this is considered, uh, Innocent III's reign is considered by many to be the height of papal power and kind of the ultimate um, manifestation of papal supremacy, which I talked about last time. And it's not just because he has such a great hat. Um, Innocent really believes he is God's representative on earth, and he is smart and quite frankly sassy, um, in a way that he can get it done. He has this power almost over almost all of Christendom. And he's really, unlike some of his predecessors, he is just ready to use it. He's also fairly young to be a pope, so he has kind of a little bit more energy than you usually find. He's a little bit uh, young pope with, um, oh, what's his name? Anyway, that TV show. Um, 
he is very interested and it shows he is very interested in expanding Christendom and fighting heresy and non-believers. And he launches two major crusades during his papacy, one in the Holy Land and one in uh, France. And we'll talk about that second one in a bit. But the first one, Innocent calls crus a crusade immediately on his election in 1198. And by now, most people realize that walking across Anatolia is for idiots and that Egypt is probably the key to victory uh, and to reconquer Jerusalem, or retake Jerusalem. And so in planning out the Fourth Crusade, the Crusaders all agree to meet in Venice in 1202, that is four years after the Crusade is initially called. And they contract with Venice for, trans for the transport of 35,000 Crusaders and their retinues and their horses to Egypt. And this, the Venice Venetians give them a deal and say that will be only 85,000 silver marks. Because Venice upholds its part of the deal. It more or less suspends its trading. It stops building all other ships, except for those that can carry the Crusaders. And it looks to use a good third of its population as manpower to sail this massive fleet of 500 ships to take these Crusaders over to Egypt. But they wait and they wait and they wait. And eventually, only about 10,000 Crusaders, less than a third of the promised total, show up. And even after wrangling and, you know, threatening and pleading, the Crusaders can only give them about 50,000 marks, which is not nearly enough to even cover expenses. We're, gonna, we're about to go into massive financial crisis, the, your, and Venice is the largest trading uh, Venice and Genoa are the two largest trading powers in the Mediterranean, and one of them going into basically insolvency over participation in this crusade. And so they don't want to just be like, oh, well, too bad. We'll just take this money. That's fine. It's not fine. The, Venice is still going to be in trouble if this goes badly, right? If this crusade doesn't go off and they don't get the rest of their 35,000 marks. They don't want to disband at a loss. Um, and then we meet this guy, the Doge Dandolo of Venice. Sorry, I, 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 I couldn't resist that one. Um, it, it's necessary. Anyway, this guy, the Doge Dandolo of Venice, um, comes up with a proposal. He says to the Crusaders, help us bring our rebellious client city of Zara back into the fold and we'll call it even. Zara had rebelled in 1181 from Venice's control, but it was still a Catholic city. Not even, you know, Byzantine. It's Catholic, right? Alliance of the Pope. This is a Crusader army, and it's also a city allied with Hungary, which is a Christian kingdom, a Christian kingdom who acknowledges the Pope's supremacy. Um, and so some Crusaders simply refused Dandolo's offer and left. The Pope when he hears about this um, offer, threatens anyone who participates in the sack or the, anyone who participates in an attack on Zara with excommunication. Um, for those who don't know, excommunication is to put someone outside um, the, the sacraments in the Catholic Church. You're not allowed to receive, um, you're not allowed to confess your sins, you're not allowed to receive absolution for your sins, and you are not allowed to receive Eucharist. It is effective, da effectively damning you to hell unless you apologize, in which case you can have your uh, sacraments back. Also, if you are a king who is excommunicated, your followers are supposed to rise up in rebellion against you, which is the thing that caused the uh, civil war in Germany during the investiture contest. But Despite these threats, the Crusaders go to Zara, they take it and they pillage it, and shockingly are excommunicated for that. So the Crusaders are overwintering in Zara, having been excommunicated and not really having made back much money because it's a small town in Croatia. 
Um, when uh, fate intervenes, as it were. Prince Alexios IV of the Byzantine Empire shows up, having fled Constantinople, and says, if you come with me back to Constantinople and make me emperor, I will give you 200,000 marks of silver, and I will give you troops, and I will give you logistical support um, to execute the crusade and make it to the Holy Land. If, again, if you come and help me overthrow the reigning emperor who is Alexios III, because again, there's a shortage of names going around in medieval Europe. This is, should have been clear to even the crusaders at the time that this was an unfulfillable promise. 200,000 marks alone is an absurd sum, even for an emperor, even for an emperor of Rome. It's basically an unfulfillable promise. Um, but they're like, hey, why not? So the Crusaders go to Constantinople, and surprisingly, kind of given the fortifications of Constantinople, they succeed in overthrowing Alexios III and installing Alexios IV. Unfortunately, Alexios IV is quite bad at being emperor, um, and can, among other things, only manages to scrape together 100,000 marks to pay the Crusaders, you know, and they're sitting around with their swords. In so doing, he is forced to melt down a lot of re religious icons and artifacts to kind of turn them into gold, which pisses off his the Byzantines themselves, right? It pisses off his subjects. And so you have the Crusaders who are unsatisfied and his subordinates who are unsatisfied. And so then you have the amazingly named Mortzophilus, who is a nobleman in the Byzantine court, who is against the Crusaders, who wants to see the Crusaders expelled, Mortzophilus overthrows Alexios IV in a coup and becomes Alexios V. And again, Innocent III tells the Crusaders, back off. You're supposed to be going to Jerusalem. Stop. But instead, they invade and take Constantinople, sack, burn, and loot the city, loot its treasures, uh, and carry them back mostly to Venice. If you go to St. Mark's Square and you see those four famous horses sitting on top of the building in St. Mark's Square, those were spoils of war taken from the sack of Constantinople in 1204. They install a Latin emperor, um, and thus Constantinople is a Latin kingdom, that is to say a Western ruled kingdom, until 1261, when uh, Emperor Emmanuel VIII comes and retakes the city. From that point on, from the point at which Emmanuel retakes the city, Byzantium, the, the Roman emperor, Empire, is really just reduced to Constantinople on either side of the Bosporus. It is fatally weakened by this crusade and falls in 1143, or 1453, excuse me, to the Ottoman Empire. This act of wanton and stupid violence um, also finalizes the Great Schism, right? The, there had been a schism between the East and the West Church since 11, uh, 1054, which we talked about last class. Um, this makes it unresolvable um, until actually 2004 when John Paul II um, and the Patriarch of the uh, Eastern Orthodox Church had a reconciliation. Uh, that process is still ongoing, but at least the that's John Paul in 2004. John Paul the the second said sorry. Um, and so, in the process process of this crusade, these so called crusaders uh, managed to capture two Christian cities, uh, destroyed the Byzantine emperor empire for money, and did not make it to the Holy Land and did not do one little bit of anything about Jerusalem. The stupid crusade. Um, I said there was two crusades, which Innocent II called. The second is called in 1203 against heretics. 
and the city of Toulouse, and the Count of Toulouse, in fact. Now, we have encountered Toulouse before. Remember, Raymond IV was one of the leaders of the First Crusade. Raymond IV of Toulouse was one of the leaders of the First Crusade. Um, so what's going on? Why is he having a uh, crusade called against his successors? Um, since the middle of the, 11, of the 11, 12th century, the 1150s or so, there had been a concern over something which is called Catharism, that is a dualistic heresy. Uh, that, not that they like fighting with swords. Dualism is they, um, they, they believe in two equal and opposite gods. Um, the devil and the god have equal power. Um, usually this is rooted in something called Gnostic thought or... Um, uh, something like that. Uh, Manichaeism, if you've ever studied ancient Christianity, is a dualistic heresy. It does, the details don't quite matter here. The important thing is that the Pope actually declares a crusade in 1203 that he says, he says, if you go to the south of France and fight heretics, whatever or whomever they are, you will receive remission for your sins. And that's a justified fight. This is justified use of violence here in the south of France. Um, the oaths to the south of, south of France have shorter durations. There are 40 days instead of like traveling all the way to Jerusalem. Um, and still kind of offer most of the same benefits. So a lot of people kind of take them up on it. And so there's a lot of violence in and around Toulouse um, before the kind of in the in the 12, in the early first decade of the 12th, 13th century. The Pope kind of this, this violence and kind of the papal calls to crusade intensify after the murder of Peter of Castelnau, who is a papal ambassador, who is, in theory, killed by the uh, subordinates of the Counts of Toulouse in 1208 on the road. And this really, that that's when the crusade actually kicks off. Even though the first kind of crusading indulgence, we might call it, was 1203, the crusade really starts in 1208, 1209. And in this, we see crusaders sack and massacre the town of Béziers, which is kind of on the coast there. I don't think it's marked on this map. It is not marked on this map. Anyway, they sack and murder the inhabitants of the town of Béziers, which is where, if you've ever been to a biker bar and you see the t-shirt that says, kill them all, God will sort it out. Um, tu es les tu, Dieu c'est ce, uh, kill them all, God will know his own. Um, it's the command of the uh, command, is, is the order of the commander of the crusader army that initiates the sack of Bézier. Um This crusade, I don't want to get into details of it. If you want, you can read my dissertation. Um, I also actually have, a, there's a podcast I did, which I can send around if people want. Um, this crusade kind of drags for a while. The Capetians, which are to say the kings of France, the, the di dynasty of Hugh Capet, um, intervenes finally in the south in 1226. The Treaty of Paris in 1229 uh, is signed, and in this, Raymond VII, so uh, Raymond IV's great-great-great-grandson, um, who is not, who does, uh, promises that the kings of France will inherit his county after he dies. Um, so it's not a complete surrender, but as soon as Raymond VII dies, Toulouse belongs to the French crown directly. And from that point on, the south of France belongs to the French crown directly. There are later crusades. Um, the Fifth Crusade, again, in 1217 to 1221, tries to go to Cairo. Uh, they just kind of slowly starve while besieging Cairo and accomplish nothing. The Sixth Crusade, uh, 1228 to 1229, Frederick II, the Holy Roman Emperor, negotiates the surrender of Jerusalem for 10 years while he is under a ban of excommunication from the Pope. Um, there's a lot of, lot of politics going on there that we don't have the time or I, really it's not important to anything we're doing to get into. Um, but let's just say Frederick II was born in Sicily and spoke Arabic and therefore was able to kind of negotiate in person the surrender of Jerusalem. And yes, he is the Holy Roman Empire, Emperor. So we just, that might upend some sort of people's 
conceptions of the way the, the, the kind of the landscapes that we have here and the people who are ruling these empires. Uh, of course, the um, Jerusalem is immediately taken in 1239 when the treaty ends. Um, but hey, 10 years back, he got it back. And the only person to manage to do it is Frederick II while being excommunicated. The Seventh Crusade, uh, 1248 to, 12, uh, to 1254. Um, this is the crusade of Louis IX of France, otherwise known as Saint Louis, um, of whom the city is named. Again, um, this leads to mostly slowly starving around Cairo. Uh, Louis, in this time, is captured and ransomed for 800,000 Byzants. Remember, Byzants are a gold coin for the empire. That's a lot of money. The Eighth Crusade, 1270, Louis goes again and just dies of dysentery. Acre, the last crusader city uh, in the Middle East, falls in 1291, and that is the la end of the Latin presence in the Eastern Mediterranean. So, kind of conclusions from this. Crusading was never quite coherent, right? It didn't have a firm set ideology when it set out. And it quickly, the idea of holy war generally, quickly adapted to diverse contexts, right? We had not only crusades against the Holy Land, but then crusades against other bits of the Holy Land that will lead us to capture other bits of the Holy Land, crusades against the Wends, uh, crusades against Lisbon, crusades against the south of France. Popes also started, started calling crusades whenever someone opposed them as kind of a way to get an army to go fight, uh, you know, if the emperor started pissing them off, crusade against the emperor. But the Pope's calling, calling crusades with this sort of regularity had an obvious exhausting effect, and the popes themselves stopped looking like a religious leader and started looking like secular princes, and this weakens the papacy greatly. In fact, I said uh, Innocent III, who, again, uh, 1198 to 1216, is considered the height of papal power, at the end of that same century, um, Boniface VIII, the Pope there, is quite literally beaten to death by the minions of the French king. This is the French king, Philippe le Bel, who is also the guy who manages to destroy the Order of the Knights Templar. So in a very real sense, kind of crusading and the politics involved in crusading and the idea of crusade uh, fundamentally destroy papal power. Crusades are then failures of both conquest and multiculturalism. They may have even kind of led to an European kind of inferiority complex as the Europeans trying to negotiate the fact that they, they did not win. With God on their side, or with God theoretically supporting them, they did not win. And they had to kind of come to grips with that. This is where we get the legend, if you've ever heard the legend of Prester John, which is a mythical Christian kingdom in somewhere in Asia, which is waiting till the proper time to come in and crush all Muslims. Uh, this is where the legend of Prester Don gets going. And the Crusades were really quite a blip in the Muslim world, very little of which was affected by them outside of the Iberian Peninsula. The Crusades destroy the Eastern Roman Empire and permanently fragment Christianity for the first time. And the Crusades help solidify France as a state and French royal power. And then they fade out of everyone's memory. And we'll be talking about that next time. A reminder that projects are due on Friday. Um, again, questions and stuff about those, let me know. And next week we will be watching a movie. I actually think, I, I had said we we're going to do it on Zoom. I actually figured out, I think, how to upload it to Canvas so everyone can watch it on their own time. I might just do a Zoom thing anyway because uh, that's kind of I, it's a cultural activity, I guess. Um, we'll see um, if people are interested in that still. Oh, 
That's the fall of that. Yeah, that's the fall of Acre. Um, other than that, if you have questions on this lecture, again, please remember to email me by Thursday at noon. Um, and I look forward to seeing you in section on Friday.